Good morning, everybody. I am happy that you guys decided to come to church today. I hope you're happy that you came. It's going to be a great service. And uh, I know that all of you that are there can sing almost as loud as we can. So I think you could. I, can you guys help me out with that this morning? Okay, perfect. Why don't you stand with us?
as you have poured out grace. You brought me out of darkness. You have filled me with peace. Giver of mercy, or my help in time of need. And Lord, I can't help but see.
I just love that verse in that song where he says, all his promises are yes and amen. In the book of Isaiah, it's prophesied of the coming of Jesus. And then they rest in that promise for 700 years before Jesus shows up on the scene. So if you're waiting on something, God is faithful, God is good, and you just have to rest in that promise because it's gonna come to fruition. Come on. Well, I just want to welcome everybody to the church at South Edmonton. It's so nice that you guys came online or in person. If it's your first time here or a first time in a long time, we have connect cards in the seats in front of you. Also, there's a link online that you can fill out. We'd love to get connected with you and tell you everything that's going on at this church. Um, If you need prayer, we'd love to pray with you and for you. Uh, We have amazing people that are just on this email thread, and we will just go to war with you. So if you need prayer, just contact us at prayeratthechurchsc.com, and we will pray with you. And now there's, uh, there's so many ways you can give back to God's kingdom and help us here at the church at South Edmonton. There's e-transfers. Uh, you can give on our website. There's snail mail. And uh, there's the booth at the back. So I just love to pray over this offering. Father God, we just want to thank you for partnering, for the, to be able to partner with your kingdom. We just want to give our finances to you, give our problems to you. We just pray over everyone that comes out of a heart of thanksgiving that they would be blessed in Jesus' name. Amen. I just want to speak the name of Jesus. Over every heart and every mind Cause I know there is peace within your presence I speak Jesus I just want to speak the name of Jesus Till every dark addiction starts to break Declaring there is hope within this freedom, I speak Jesus. Cause your name is power, your name is healing, your name is love. Break every stronghold, shine through the shadow.
tried so hard to see it took me so long to believe it you choose someone like me to carry your victory perfection could never earn it you give what you don't deserve it take the broken things and raise them to glory you are my champion giants all when you stand undefeated every battle you've won I am who you say
Say holy. Holy, holy is your name, Jesus. Holy, holy, Jesus. The reign of darkness now has ended. In the kingdom of light, in the kingdom of light, forever under your dominion, you're the king of my life, you're the king of my life, you reign Jesus, you reign above it all. On the cross, the work was finished. God, you poured out your life just to give us new life. Now from the lips of the forgiven, hear an anthem of
Jesus, you reign. Sing that one more time. Then all of heaven and the earth erupt in song. Sing hallelujah to the everlasting one. There is no higher name. Jesus, you reign above it all. Father God, you reign. You reign in our lives. You, lay, you reign in our city. You reign over our families, our marriages, our friends, our businesses, our places of work, God. You reign. We thank you. We thank you, Father. We give you honor. We give you praise. We give you the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. You guys may be seated. Welcome to the church at South Edmonton. My name is Chantel, and if you don't already know me or you are just getting to know me, I am one of the volunteers here at the church of South Edmonton, and I have, we have been coming here for just over 11 years. And a couple things about myself. I'm married to one of the most handsome pieces of flesh on this planet. His name is Jeremy. He's sitting front row. Thanks, babe. We have been married for just over 11 years, and life gets so much better, let me tell you. It keeps getting better every day. So, as you guys know, we just finished a woman's Bible study if you were a part of it, you know that we were studying Joshua. It was online. And we finished just before Christmas, so it was very fitting that we speak on Joshua today. And if you didn't read Joshua with us, that's okay. You can go home and read it for yourself. Read the whole Bible. It's all very good. But we'll be talking today in Joshua 5 and chapter 6. And... Perry, wherever he is, he said, it's probably going to be a pretty light service, pretty short service. And I resent that comment. So we are going to be reading two full chapters. Just kidding. Well, why don't we just dive right in. So Joshua 5, verses 2 to 10 is kind of where we start. So at that time, Joshua said, sorry, the Lord said to Joshua, make flint knives and circumcise the Israelites again. So Joshua made flint knives and circumcised the Israelites at Gebeth Harath. And this is why he did so. All of those that came out of Egypt, all of the men of military age, died in the wilderness along the way after leaving Egypt. All of the people that had come out had been circumcised, but all the people that were born in the wilderness during the journey from Egypt had not. The Israelites moved about in the wilderness for about 40 years until all of the men of military age died since they had not obeyed the Lord. For the Lord had sworn to them that they would not see the land he had solemnly promised their ancestors to give us, and a land flowing with milk and honey. So he raised up their sons in their place, and these were the ones who Joshua had circumcised along the way. Sorry. These were the ones that Joshua had circumcised. So there was still a whole new nation that had not been circumcised, and they remained in camp until they were healed. The Lord said to Joshua, Today I have rolled away the reproach of Egypt from you. So then this place has been called Gilgal until that day. Verse 10, on the evening of the fourth day, while they camped on the plains of Jericho, the Israelites celebrated Passover. The day after Passover and on that very day, they ate some of the produce of the land, the unleavened bread and roasted grain, 
After that day, the manna had stopped because they ate food from the land and there was no longer any manna for the Israelites. But after that year, they ate of the produce of Canaan. Chapter six. Now I know it's long, but bear with me. It's all gonna make sense. So now the gates of Jericho were securely barred because of the Israelites. No one came in and no one came out. The Lord said to Joshua, See, I have delivered Jericho into your hands along with the kings and all its fighting men. March once around the city with all of the armed men. Do this for six days. Have the seven priests carry the trumpets of ram's horns in front of the ark. And on the seventh day, march around the city seven times with the priests blowing their trumpets. When you hear the sound of a long blast on the trumpets, have the whole army give a loud shout and the wall will collapse. The army will go up and everyone will go straight in. So the Lord, sorry, so Joshua, the son of Nan, called the priests and said to him, take up the ark of the covenant of the Lord, have the seven priests carry trumpets in front of it. And he ordered the army advance, march into the city with an armed guard going straight ahead of the ark of the Lord. Joshua had spoken this to the people seven priests carrying seven trumpets before the Lord went before, blowing the trumpets and the ark of the Lord's covenant followed them. The armed guard marched ahead of the priests who blew the trumpets and the rear guard followed the ark. All of this time the trumpets were sounding, but Joshua, and I read all of this to get to verse 10, Joshua commanded the army, do not give a war cry, do not raise your voices, Do not say a word until the day I tell you to shout, then shout. So he had the ark of the Lord carried around the city, circling it once, and then the army returned to the camp and spent the night there. I know I think I have a couple more verses, but we'll just stop there for time's sake. So to recap, what just happened is the Israelites who were in captivity, in bondage for 400 years in Egypt had just been delivered. God had just delivered them from their bondage, from their slavery, over a series of signs and miracles. He let them out of Egypt, parted the Red Sea, led them through the wilderness, parted the Jordan, and now they are standing on the edge. Sorry, actually, at this point, they are in Canaan. They are in the promised land, and they are staring at the walls of Jericho. They were held captive for 400 years with no rights, no privileges. But God defeated their oppressor. Now they are delivered, but not free. See, there is a difference between deliverance and freedom. A lot of Christians don't even know the difference. Freedom is Canaan. Freedom is the promised land. Freedom was never in the wilderness. This is how I know. Deuteronomy says that Canaan was an 11 day journey from Egypt. Brendan, do you wanna put up that first map? Thanks to Google Maps, we have a really good idea of what this would have looked like. 11 direct days to the promised lamb. But Deuteronomy says after the 40th year. Do you wanna do the next map, Brennan? (laughs) After the 40th year of wandering in the promised land, So many Christians are doing laps in the desert, going around the same mountains, circling Mount Sinai, the same areas of bitterness, greed, lust, envy, condemnation, shame. They never get to the promised land. For years and years and years, Christians can be delivered, but not free. See, you could be delivered from your situation, abuse, whatever it is, but you're still in the same mindset of destruction. So God says, I'm gonna take you through that wilderness to get Egypt out of you. 
because you can't have the same mindset you did in the wilderness as you will in the promised land. After all this time, we see an entire generation die off in the wilderness. God raises up then a new generation. See, that's what happens when, when one generation doesn't do it. The second, God will say, that's okay, I'm going to raise up a new generation and I'll get them to do it. Has this ever happened to you? This happened to me. God gives me a word for someone and I'm sitting there in my chair and I am shaking in fear and doubt and I can't get that word off my lips because I am so nervous to get it wrong that I don't obey and then someone else like Steve stands up and gives that word to that person, that exact word that was on my heart. If I don't do it, God will find someone else to do it. So he raises up another generation And this brings us to the text where we just read where this second generation, this new generation, is standing in the promised land on the banks and they are staring at their promise. But God says, all right, now before you go in, there's a couple things we gotta do to get the wilderness out of you. The first thing God says to Joshua in chapter one is be strong and courageous. Be careful to obey the law my servant Moses gave to you. Do not turn to the left or to the right. Be successful in everything you do. Keep this book of law on your lips. Meditate on it day and night that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. Doesn't it seem a bit bold to say that you will find success if you exactly follow the word? Yeah, but Chantel, I've had some stumbling blocks along the way. I get it. But we don't measure, the world doesn't measure success the same way that God measures success. Success is more abundant life. And this isn't just a formula or a set of, set of rules because we know that there isn't something that we have to do. There's no six six steps to success in the kingdom. We're not legalistic, we don't follow rules, but these are principles, principles for success. God says, it is better to obey than sacrifice. And to heed my word is better than the fat of rams. In Samuel, God had instructed Saul to attack the Amalekites and destroy everything that belonged to them. Every single thing, wipe it out. But what Saul ended up doing was he attacked his enemy, but he saved the best cattle, the best lambs, the best crops for himself because he thought, I'm going to keep this not for myself, I'm gonna sacrifice, I'm gonna bring it to the temple and sacrifice it to the Lord. He thought he knew better than what God had instructed him to do. And then Samuel, the prophet, comes the next day and says, Saul, what is this that I hear? The bleeding of lambs and the lowing of cattle. You didn't listen. Why didn't you listen? God said, wipe everything out. So the first thing that God instructs them to do is to circumcise them again. And every guy here is like, girl, you have no place talking to me about circumcision. (laughs) But this is an action. It's, It's symbolic for a cutting of your heart. Because once you circumcise your heart, once God marks you, you are never the same again. You never look like you did in the past to God. So the cutting away, why? Because the first generation paid the price. And you're not going into the promised land based off of someone else's sacrifice. You have to sacrifice for yourself. Someone made a lot of sacrifices for you to be here today. Someone sacrificed their time, their money, to plow the parking lot, to watch your kids in kids church to clean the church, to show up Thursday night for band practice, to maintain the building, to show up for pre-service prayer, interceding for salvations and for a word of God to move on someone in here. And God's saying, that's great. I'm glad you're here on someone else's sacrifice. But if you want to go from glory to glory, we want you to pay your own price. 
the writers of Hebrew said in the New Testament, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that trips us up. See, there's a difference between weight and sin. Weight, something that anchors you, holds you back. It might not necessarily be a bad thing, but it is something that's holding you back from progressing and going up to that next step. See, it could be your friends, maybe Christian friends, heaven bound. But if those circle of friends are no longer catapulting you forward, they're holding you back. Watch who is speaking into your life, who is on your council, who is on your board that is giving you advice. I have a girlfriend and maybe I was venting to her about something. <laughs> we all go through things, okay? I'm human. And I can't even repeat on stage what she said. But I'm not going to listen to that advice because that's not God advice. That's not Jesus advice. That's not how my Savior would do it. So watch who is speaking into your life and giving you advice. Weight could even be your level of, this is gonna tick some people off, serving or generosity. You've been serving for a little while, or maybe a long while, you've been doing the same thing. Maybe it's time to step it up. If it's not a sacrifice, it's not, it's, it's not costing you anything. Then the writer of Hebrews mentions sin especially the sin that so easily trips us up. Whenever us Christians think of sin, we think of maybe one or two behaviors as if Christianity is a behavior modification program. We like to cover up sin, or the world likes to cover up sin. See, if I take a bottle of oat milk and I put it, because I like because I'm a hippie and I drink oat milk. And if I put oat milk in your fridge, but I put a label on it and, or sorry, I completely screwed up that analogy. If I take a bottle of poison and put it in your fridge, but I take a label and I put it and it says oat milk, you guys will drink it thinking that it's oat milk, but that poison is gonna kill you. And we do the same thing with sin, where you say, it's not really that bad. It's not really that harmful. It's not really gonna hurt me. But the problem is, is that you're still ingesting poison. It's still going to harm you, even if you don't think it is. A few years ago, we brought in to case a special guest minister. And usually when you have like a special guest, you just wanna put on a nice show, you wear your best outfit, you want to give them your best foot forward, correct? So I was scheduled to introduce this guest speaker, and we had a naysayer on the team, and he said, it looks like we scheduled our B team. Ouch. And if I had listened to that voice, I don't know if I would be here today. I'm not that good. Obviously, he doesn't think that I'm good. What does everyone else think of me? But, I mean, I'm up here preaching and he's not, so that's a whole nother, it's a whole nother service. <laughs> it's about your potential, too. I watched families receive prophetic words on their life, and within a series of a couple of months, they've completely left the church. And they're complaining that their word didn't come true, that their prophetic word didn't happen. Well, I can't, I'm tired of sitting around waiting for my word to come true. And it wasn't because of lack of talent or potential. You have to cut off that dead weight. What are you willing to sacrifice to move forward to that next glory? The second thing that God asked them to do or instructed them to do, my second point is they paused and they kept the Passover. 
So God said there is more land to conquer. There are more people to save. There is more promise to receive. There is more to do. Let's keep moving. But just first stop and let's receive Jesus. Let's receive. Let's pause and fill ourselves with Jesus. What is feeding you? How many hours a day are you watching TV versus reading your Bible? And I'm not trying to be legalistic here. I love a good reality TV show. Ask my husband. I watch all the housewives. But, and he does too. But, what is feeding you? I'll tell you right now, the day that I started that habit of daily Bible reading, my life changed. And I said, there's so many, you know, there's so many things that I want to do in a day. Get up and I read my Bible and then I clean the kitchen and then I work out and then I go to work and then I come home and I make meals and then I do all these other things and I maybe some errands along the way. Like, is there enough time in the day to do it all? And Jeremy says, yeah, you're just going to have to cut something else out. So I make Bible reading, scripture reading, time and prayer a priority. And God wants us to feed ourselves with his presence. That's daily nourishment. How about we stop, we start filling ourselves with the thing that we keep telling the world will satisfy us and nourish us and stop trying to find nourishment from those things in life that don't actually nourish the next house, the next job, the next book, the next degree, the next, next, the next, the next, the next. Christ is enough, and in him, we have everything we need to succeed. So they had the Passover, they ate from the produce of the land, and then the manna stopped. See, for 40 years in the desert, this is how they lived. This is how God provided for them. They woke up, there was manna. Monday, manna. Tuesday, manna. Wednesday, manna. Thursday, manna manna. This way of provision served a purpose for that time and for that previous generation, but now they're living in the promised land, and God's like, I'm not doing it that way anymore. The manna has stopped. How many times do we operate out of a place of habit instead of faith? This is how God did it, Then this is how he did it for my parents. So they just wake up and think that God's going to drop it out of the sky because this is how he did it for so long. This is the formula. This is what works. Maybe that's how God did it in the wilderness, but that's not how he's going to do it in the promised land. He said to Joshua, I want you to dig your own wells, plant your own crops, because I'm going to now tap into the potential that I've put in you. I'm going to activate my principle of seed, time, and harvest, and I am going to give you a new level of success. See, there's a difference between a wilderness Christian and a promised land Christian. Both might be heaven bound, but a wilderness Christian will look at me and say, well, you're just full of prosperity. You just want money. What are you just, I have, my own family looked at me and said, are you just going to name it and claim it? No, I'm living in a generosity gospel. Listen, this is what Jesus has done for me. God said in chapter one, meditate on my word day and night and you will have success. He wants to partner with us. I've partnered with the king. Ah, that feels so good. Just because that's how God did it for 40 years, for the generation before, doesn't mean that's how you're gonna see your breakthrough. Some of you are still singing the same song that you did 10 years ago because that's how you saw a breakthrough the first time. But the manna has ceased. You keep going back around singing Noah's Ark's greatest hits, but that manna is stale and it's moldy and it's dehydrated. And God said, it's ceased, I'm doing a new thing here. Some of you are stuck on what someone said to you in the past. You're part of the B team. You're dumb. Your business failed. You're no good. 
and nothing is going to change your past. The blood of Jesus doesn't give you amnesia. You don't forget those things, but it does give you a life beyond your past. Do not allow what someone has done to you to be bigger than what Jesus has done for you. The world will tell you you're a victim, but people, I've read the book. I know the ending, and I know that he came for us, and we are more than conquerors in Jesus Christ. My life isn't mine. I was bought for a price. I am no longer a slave. I am delivered and I'm free. So what do you do when you've cut the wilderness away? You're walking in faith. You've planted your own fields. You've done everything right. You've been obedient. You haven't turned from the left or to the right. God's part of the Red Sea. He defeated the Egyptians. He's pushed back the Jordan. And now you're standing in front of a wall. Suddenly your spouse leaves. Your child goes AWOL. Your business fails. Your partner's walked away from you. Doctor report comes back with bad news. God, I've been doing everything right. Why isn't this working? What do you do when you hit the wall? And that brings me to my third point, which is take another lap and shut your mouth. My Oma is sitting here, and she's upset with me because I said shut your mouth on stage. We'll talk about it later. I love you. Because the Bible said that the walls of Jericho were tightly shut up. No one came in and no one came out. But God said to Joshua, I want you to see the potential. I want you to see the promise that's on the other side of this wall. Don't look at the wall, look at me. Remember that movie, Captain Phillips? And the bad guys, the pirates, they took over the captain's ship and they took them all hostages, and the bad guy looks at Captain Jack Phillips, and he goes, look at me. I'm the captain now. That's God. He's going, don't look at them. Look at me. Keep your eyes on me. There is nothing that you can do to make this wall fall, but I am the Lord your God, and I move mountains. I want you to march around this wall six times. I want your obedience. I want you to partner with me, I want you to keep going and don't give up now. Some of you guys are on the edge of giving up because you've done everything right to this point and you can't understand why things are not going your way. But do not let it, discouragement get the better of you. God is saying, I need you to do another lap. I need you to keep going. I need you to not give up. Keep going to church. Keep serving. Keep honoring God. Keep going. Take another lap. Don't stop. Have you made your wall bigger than your God? The God of our universe is made big or small in the hearts of the people. Why do we start with worship? Contrary to what most people believe, we don't just sing for 20 minutes so that all the late people can show up. There is a purpose when you walk in and you start exalting God and making him bigger than your problems suddenly the weight that was on your shoulders falls off. And you might not be able to change the facts of your circumstance, but when you worship, everything changes. So God said to Joshua, you are going to march around the city once a day for six days, and then on seventh day, do it seven times, and then we're going to shout and the walls are going to come down. These are the most heavily fortified walls in all documented in all of history, 30 feet high, tightly shut up, no one came in, no one came out. God says, yeah, yeah, toga, sandals, trumpets, blow, walls fall down. Joshua's like, great, is there a plan B? Because I gotta go back now and take this plan back to the Israelites, and we know what happened last time. Then you have the naysayers that think that it's their job to say, doesn't sound like a good plan, yeah, like we don't already know. 
So you're telling me that we're just supposed to be consistent, show up, raise a hallelujah, and it's all gonna be okay? Joshua's thinking, all right, so last time I sent 10 guys out, 12 guys out, 10 of them came back with a bad report, spread doubt, kept an entire generation in the desert for 40 years. So this time, Joshua goes back and he commanded the army, do not give a war cry, do not raise your voices, do not say a word until I command you to shout. So the New King James Version says, thus saith the Lord, shutteth, uppeth. This is why, because until you can say what God is saying, until your confession aligns with the word of God, then don't say anything at all. Don't speak the lies, don't spread the doubt, don't be a self-fulfilling prophecy. Doubt dies unborn if it's never spoke. And we need to raise up a new generation of Christians and stop articulating doubt and negativity. Because we are making matters worse by agreeing with the enemy because all you see is a wall and you're making the facts bigger than the truth. We need to make our God bigger than that wall. So God says, if you can't say what I'm saying, don't say anything at all. Don't settle for being delivered in the wilderness when you can be free in the promised land. Don't settle for the verge when God has so much more for you in every sphere of your life, emotionally, physically, spiritually, relationally, financially. At every level, if you want more of the kingdom, abundant life, everything that God has to offer. We believe that he takes you from glory to glory. There is so much more. You have to make a conscious effort though to cut off that wilderness, to cut off the dead weight and leave it behind. And don't go back to those same patterns, those same destructive behaviors. And I don't wanna ruin the end of the book for you. You can go home and read it for yourself. But on the seventh day, being what was significant about that was the Sabbath. And we know that we, historically, they don't, they, the Israelites never did any work on the Sabbath. So that seventh day was for God to do his work. So they marched around the city seven times, they blew their trumpets and they let God do the rest for them. And that wall came down. Then before Joshua died in chapter 22, this is really good, Joshua ends up saying to all of the tribes of Israel, you have done all that Moses, the servant of the Lord, has commanded, and you obeyed me in everything I commanded. Then Joshua sent them home and he blessed them, saying, return to your homes with great wealth, large herds of livestock, silver, bronze, gold, iron, and a great quantity of clothing. Yes, please. And divide the plunder from your enemies with your fellow Israelites. Isn't it so funny how God blesses us? There is, and, and it, it's not, again, it's not legalistic. It's not because we did six steps but your obedience and then your honor is directly linked to blessing. He wants this for you. It's all about principle and aligning your desires with kingdom desires. It's about obedience, consistency, showing up, making the word of God a priority that you wouldn't turn from the left or to the right. Meditating on it day and night and he will not fail you. So I just wanna ask you, do you know him? 
maybe you've been delivered, but you want that next step of glory. You want that freedom in him. I want to give an opportunity before we close for the band to come back. And if you want to know more of him and you want freedom, that you can have that today, that all you have to do is ask and agree that he's your partner in life and that you would give up the reins and you would allow him to direct you. If that's you today and you want that, let's bow our heads and close our eyes and I want to pray a blessing over you. Father God, we thank you for who you are and for what you do. We thank you that you have delivered us and that you have set us free through the blood of Jesus Christ, that we have cut off the wilderness, that we fill ourselves with you every day, that you nourish us, that you are enough. God, we invite you in to be Lord of our lives and we cast off everything that is holding us back. We thank you for freedom in Jesus' name. Amen. Shout Jesus from the mountains, Jesus in the streets, Jesus in the darkness over every enemy. Jesus for my family, I speak the holy name, Jesus. Sing that again with me. Shout Jesus from the mountains, Jesus in the streets, Jesus in the darkness over every enemy. Jesus for my family, I speak the holy name, Jesus. Shout Jesus from the mountains, Jesus in the streets, Jesus in the darkness over every enemy. Jesus for my family, I speak the holy name. blessing over you in in numbers God had instructed this priestly blessing that we like to give to everyone that sh that comes to church on a Sunday we believe that the blessing is for everyone and if this is something that you want to receive just hold out your hands may the Lord bless you and keep you may the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you May the Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace.
In Jesus' name, have a wonderful rest of your year, rest of your day, and we will see you next week.